Sweet. So a bit about me. Uh, I'm Yi. I'm a high school senior. I'm the software robot lead and drive base uh, operator for 1678. This is my, I'm going to my third year driving. So I started after 2021 and guess I'm still around. Cool, so just an outline. Uh, we're gonna be going over why driving is important. Um, a bit, a couple tips on like how to effectively practice. Okay, and then um, after that, we're gonna go over some tips for comp like in competition, and then we're gonna end with some example match reviews. Yep. Cool. So why why do you want to be good at driving? Um, a lot of this seems pretty obvious, but just to reiterate, uh, a lot of times teams will focus a ton on having software or like autos or hardware and just sort of working till the end, when in reality, um, having like a capable robot is only gonna get you so far, right? You need your drive team and your operating team and your, your strategy team, I guess, to be comfortable like controlling the robot and actually getting it to do what it was designed to do. Um, if you don't believe me, a uh, fun, uh, fun statistic is that 29 out of the 32 teams in Galileo division playoffs, uh, we scouted in the top 32 for drivability. I don't know how to do division off the top of my head, but that's a pretty good percent. Cool. Uh, preseason. What should you do preseason? All right, preseason. You should pick a permanent drive team. Um, a lot of teams, or not a lot of teams, but some teams will rotate um, drive teams in season. And whenever we're with a team that like, oh yeah, we have new drivers. We're always like, it's the fourth week of competition. Why do you have new drivers? So when you're looking for a drive team, um, some of the things that you should look for are available time, uh, maturity, and just communication skills in general. And then uh, bonus on top of that is having robot knowledge. So knowing how to fix issues before and during a match um, helps a lot. You might notice that uh, none of the qualities here are being good at driving a robot because I'll be real, like having stick, uh, being good at sticks on the sticks when you first start out is not super useful because you will get better through practice not through like innate talent or anything. Um, besides picking a permanent drive team, uh, you guys should go to off-season competitions. You're here, so we already started on that. That's good. Um, off-season comps are a great way to train your drivers, get them actual behind the glass time, which is really helpful because the transition from being like in your practice field and like being chill uh, to actual matches with like crowds and like pressure, uh, it, can be, it can be a bit of a hard transition. So off-season comps are a great way to uh, get used to that. We actually run new drive teams at Madtown Throwdown using our uh, B bots and C bots. Do you have C bots? Sometimes. <laughs> using our B bots and C bots just to get younger kids um, time, like actually on a field. And then lastly, uh, I know it kind of sucks that FRC is this way, but having a swerve drive really, really does help with on field maneuverability, especially with the rule changes next season, uh, only limiting you to four. Uh, motors on your drivetrain. There's really no downside to building a swerve. So uh, as much as it sucks, kind of over for tank. But even if you don't have um, resources to build a swerve drive, like doing like the practice and some of these uh, tips will still apply. So you're not wasting your time here. Cool. Pre uh, Pre-season preparation. Uh, keep an old drive base. This is what we do. We don't disassemble our previous year's bots until the winter. Um, just so we can have both a drive base around for software testing and so we can run drive base builds uh, with drive base drills with the new drive teams. And besides that, also something you can do preseason is watch matches from uh, top teams to sort of see what they do and pick up on, yeah, some of the things they do. Uh, funny story, this year we actually got our um, cone intaking strategy from watching 2056. So everyone has something to learn. Uh, some of the teams that I recommend watching uh, I'm not going to read it to you because I'm sure you can read, but yeah, the, the recording will be up. So if you want to look at these teams and I sort of noted like what's special about each of the examples. Cool. Build season. All right. Step zero to being good at driving is have something that's drivable. So ideally you want low center of gravity, uh, easy acquisition zones. So easy can either be like super wide, like our robot this year, uh, we have a two foot wide intake. So it's pretty easy to pick up cones and cubes. Like you don't have to do like a lot of fit, like fiddling with lineup and stuff. Um, or it can be like a centering intake, like 2910. Their, um, their intake doesn't exactly center, but it's pretty narrow. So they can center using the um, 
double substation. And pretty much every time that they're trying to place a cone or a cube, it's sort of in the same spot relative to the robot. And optional for a lot of teams is not accessible. For us, we didn't do it. But um, automation can also make driving a lot easier. Cool. Uh, something you can also do in build season that we like to do every year is create what's called a call-out plan. So what we do is we basically have a plan for what every thing on the field is called. So we're like, in the match, like in the heat of the moment, we're not like, yo, what is that? What is that? What is that? So some of the examples, um, 2021, we sort of split the two uh, possible paths on the field into a trick path and a rendezvous path. Um, that's just sort of what the things are called, so there's not anything special there. Uh, 2022, we used a clock system. I think this actually helped us a lot calling out where cargo was, especially if it was hidden from like, the point of view of the drivers. The drive coach can like, walk around, or like Mike last year walked around, and he was like, yo, there's two cargo at like 12 o'clock. And like, instantly we knew like, oh, we have to go around the hub and pick it up from the back. And uh, 2023, uh, a lot of teams did this. We just numbered the grid. So we went one to nine, and then high, mid, low. It's really important to make sure you're having clear communication, especially since like, when you're under pressure, it makes it a lot harder. So yeah, you want to be able to say something and instantly have everyone on the drive team know what it is. All right, control scheme. Uh, first, use a high quality gamepad. Uh, this is actually really important. Don't use like some questionable cheapo gamepad because uh, you're paying a lot to be in these matches and having a 50 buck controller like die out on you, uh, you're kind of losing money. So use a high quality gamepad, um, ideally one with like uh, sort of gamepad style. So you can use sticks too, but I think a gamepad is a lot nicer because A, it's super easy to bring backups. Like we have like five controllers in the pit. And also it's sort of like, I think a lot of us probably have experience using gamepads. So yeah. Um, in this season, you should also work with your software and your drive team to come up with a button map. So a button map is basically, uh, I'll show you an example later, but a button map is basically just like a list of what each button on the controller does and how to actually get your robot to do what it does. Um, it's super easy to have like a quick reference sheet, especially when you're just starting. Like you don't have to keep bugging your software. People are like, yo, how do I deploy the intake, right? You can just look at the map and like, yeah, easy. Uh, when you're making your button map, try to keep your thumbs free. So if you can imagine, uh, you're probably gonna be driving your robot using the two sticks here. So you don't wanna have like a bunch of robot uh, critical functions on like these buttons or like over here, because then you have to take your hands off of the sticks to press them, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so we typically bind um, all of our driver functions either to the uh, triggers here and the triggers and the bumpers on the top, or we bind them to the stick buttons. So you push down the stick to do something. Uh, yeah, probably dial down your rotation stick sensitivity. I see this a lot, but it's like a lot of teams, uh, there's their stick for ro rotating in place is like super sensitive. Like you touch it and like your robot's spinning like 90 degrees. And obviously you want to have fine control over like how much your robot's turning. Um, it's always easier to go, see, it's always easier to like go fast with a slow stick than it is to go slow with a fast stick, if that makes sense. Yeah, and then most of this for your driver. Uh, for your operator, it's more flexible. You can use what you want. Um, a lot of people use a no second controller like we do. A lot of people use a button board. I don't know, go crazy. Use a DDR map, do what you want. All right, this is the promised uh, button map. So as you can see, um, our intake forward, intake reverse, and extender stow our four most used functions are on the top of the controller. And if you notice, um, most of our things on the buttons and the uh, D-pad are either adjustments, so cup adjustments, or like things that we press when we're not moving. Like we're not gonna be X-locking our wheels while we're trying to drive across the field. Like that's something you can put on a face button. Cool. All right, how should you drill? This is, this is the, the big one. How should you drill? Um, so you should start by doing drills even before you have like a functioning robot. Like don't wait until your robot looks like this to do drills because uh, you've just wasted like two months of time that you could be using getting comfortable with your drive base. Uh, you could probably do drills when your robot's like looking like, uh, like that. Like this is a perfect drill bot right here. It's easy, nothing's gonna break, it's light. And like, yeah, you can do everything you need for drills. Um, you should focus on starting slow and smooth and speed up over time. A lot of people uh, try to go fast, like they're in their head like, go fast, right? And it's like super easy to be choppy and like stop, start, stop, start like that and like overcorrect for stuff. So you really don't want to be doing that. It's better to start slow and smooth and then speed up gradually over time as you get more comfortable. And then uh, lastly, turning while moving is super important. I see a lot of people like not turn while, turn while moving. So what they'll do is they'll have like, you have a bot here, right? Oh my God, this sprinkler. 
OK. Yeah, I'm working for me. I can draw on the screen too, after, I think. Sweet. All right, a lot of people, what they do is, uh, so you got like a robot here, on like your intakes over here, and like you got a game piece uh, here, right? So a lot of people just like want to do, and I used to do this too, is um, they'll translate the robot over, so it's over like that, and then they'll go forwards and drive through it. And this is a lot slower than if you're simply comfortable with turning while moving and having a game piece here and just rotating your robot like 30 degrees and then driving straight at it. So yeah, you should be definitely very comfortable uh, with turning while moving your robot. It's also good for defense and anti-defense. I'll get into that later. Cool, so a, couple, uh, a couple example drills with the drivetrain. Uh, one that a lot of teams do, that I actually stole this from 2910, Jack in the Bot. Uh, one that they do is the chair drill. So you basically just put an object on the field and you have your kids uh, do circles around it with one side of the robot tracking uh, the object. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, but basically, like, say you have an object here, if your robot, like, just do circles with your intake point, like, facing the object. It's like, yeah. Um, you can speed up, slow down, do what you want, and basically just get comfortable uh, turning while moving. Another one that we did this year was a, a cone, uh, cone slalom. Sorry. Um, basically, we just make a nice row of cones. You weave in between them and spin while doing it. Just probably see a theme here, getting comfortable with turning while moving. All right. So once you actually have a functioning robot, um, what we do is we split our drills into basically just practicing key actions. So key actions are going to be things that you're doing pretty much every match you play. So like every match you play, we're going to be picking up cargo in uh, 2022. We're going to be loading from the substation, placing game pieces, picking up game pieces from midfield. It's like super basic, low-level, repeatable actions that you can do over and over again. Um, and your drills should be, you can probably read, but isolated, time-limited, and scorable. So you want isolated, basically just means like you want to be doing one action over and over again. Don't like do a match. Like don't start by doing matches, because then you're not going to be able to like pinpoint any one thing to work on. You're just going to be like doing matches. Um, you should be time limited, so you want the time pressure. You want to be able to sort of simulate having to do things quickly, and you want them to be scorable. You want to be able to track your scores and like see how well you're doing, and see if any adjustments uh, adjustments you make like actually help. And last thing, uh, don't be afraid of breaking a robot. Um, it's your mechanical team to fix the robot when it breaks. It's not your it's not your job to baby the robot uh, in matches because you're never going to get the full potential if you're driving like 70% all the time. Cool. Uh, some things to make key actions easier. You can use field elements to align when you can. So last year, when we were picking up from the uh, single substation, we used the wall to square up the robot so we could drive straight at it. Um, whenever you can do something like that, uh, it makes it super easy to be repeatable and be consistent. Uh, in 2013, uh, if you know 2013, there was, these, there was these big pyramids on the field. And we, uh, for shooting, we actually squared up against the pyramid, so we knew we were aimed correctly uh, every single time. Uh, write down scores for each run. You want to be able to track trends and like see results from what you're uh, what you're working on. Uh, video is even better because video you can see exactly what you're doing and be like, "Yo, fix this." And just uh, reiterating again, start slow and smooth. You can be like painfully slow if it helps you be smooth. So always focus on smoothness before speed. Don't be choppy. Rinse water. So I just came straight from the back. <laughs> yeah, so sort of iterating on don't be choppy. Uh, these are two uh, sort of clips of us picking up from the single substation. You can see one, we sort of stutter here. We're like, we stop, like, and then go again. And then the second one, sort of smooth motion. So you definitely want to be more like this and less like that. And you can see this one's obviously faster. Yeah, the GIFs are going to stop lining up, but you get the idea. Cool. Uh, some example drills that we did. So in 2023, we sort of uh, wanted to focus, we wanted to do scoring and picking up from the ground. Those were our two key actions that we identified. So a drill that we did was you basically place out the four um, game pieces in their auto spots. You start from touching the grid, and then you score them as fast as you can. You can do like high, mid, low, and do different drills like that. And then another one is we wanted to sort of like figure out that we were really not that bad at picking up from the ground, but we were really slow on scoring. So we just cut out the ground pickup part entirely 
and we intake uh, cones from a human and then score them directly. Just focus on the scoring because that's what you want to see reflected in your score, in your uh, drill scores and your times. Uh, and in 2022, um, it's sort of the same thing. You put game pieces in preset spots, you pick them up, and you score as fast as you can. And however many you do in X seconds, uh, that's what you, your score. And then something we added in 2022, uh, we found that it was super easy to lose track of cargo, especially like behind the hub, behind other robots, and like lose vision of it. So we added a caveat to the drill where we're only picking up cargo that our drive coach calls, calls out. So that sort of trains us to listen to the drive coach and basically, yeah, like take directions and go to the ones that he's calling out instead of just like super easy to tune out um, communications in a match. So we just wanted to focus on listening. This is an example of uh, us tracking our drills. You don't have to be this draconian. You can just like write them on a whiteboard, but uh, some of our mentors are nerds and they made a spreadsheet. So you can see we're tracking uh, the time it takes to do each cycle and we have pictures showing like how to set up. Um, and hopefully it gets faster and faster as you go on. Cool, so after you're done with drills, like after you have like a basic um, as competency with uh, doing your key actions, you want to pivot to match simulation. So simulated matches are awesome for basically like testing your robot, right? Because that's what it's actually gonna be doing in matches and that's what you want to practice. Practice how you, wait, what? I don't know. I, there's a saying about it, I forgot. But yeah, um, when you simulate matches, you want to include all sections of the game. You want to include auto, telly, and gen, uh, end game. Don't just do telly because you can also use this time to like work on your autos, work on your end game alignment. Like basically pretend you're on a match, have someone set a timer, and then do all of the stages of a match. Um, Touching us again, don't be afraid of breaking the robot. Uh, you're in the shop, fixing the robot should be easy. So, um, and if it's gonna like break from any like hard driving, like you want your mechanical team to know about it. Uh, track your scores. Yeah, you wanna see trends? I, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself because the ba same basic principles apply to like all practice that you're doing. And uh, record any robot failures. This is actually pretty important. Um, if the robot like breaks in a match or you lose comms or something, don't just like not record the match. You should write down like when that happens and have it be visible as an issue both for like your mechanical team as and sort of like so you can track like, oh, this is happening a lot. We should fix it. And yeah, um, if the year calls for it, running defense matches with like a previous year's bot is really helpful too. Uh, in 2022, after our first competition, we pretty much like entirely pivoted to running under defense um, because we found like, oh yeah, open field scoring, it's not that bad, but we really struggle and we take a large uh, scoring hit when we're under defense. So we want to get better at that. Cool, competition. All right, pre-match. Um, it's super helpful to have someone like coordinate your strategy. So this can either be like, we have a strategy student who does it, but you basically want all three of your alliance members to know what's going on. Like don't get each other's way and sort of know the, know, like, yeah, know what's going on. Um, something that we, we started doing is we review uh, the plan with our alliance partners while we're queuing. Because uh, sometimes, on, especially on like bigger teams or like less organized teams, um, the person that you're talking to for strategy might not necessarily be like someone on the drive team. So you basically 100% want the drive, the, the drive teams to basically be in agreement with what's going on. Uh, how many strategy board helps? We started printing out uh, sort of like big boards. There's laminated paper. We come from like, and you know where we get them from? The boards? Like Office Max? Yeah, but like, are they, what are they printed on? It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Okay, whatever. Yeah, but like, this can be, this can be whatever you want. It can be like an iPad. It can be like a printed out piece of paper. You see, you want some way to visualize the field um, while you're in the queue. And then basically the entire point is that a good match should be boring. Like you don't want any surprises in the match. You want like every match that we're like, oh yeah, that went exactly the plan. Like that's what we want. We want it to be boring. Cool, yeah, this is an example of a strategy board. Um, this is from Chessy Champs. And basically what we've done is we just take field renderings and put them on a laminated piece of paper. And our strategy lead uses uh, expo markers to just write out what we're doing, like where we're scoring, what we're doing for Edgame. This is the whole match. Oh boy, yeah, there we go. All right, in a match, uh, focus on staying calm. Uh, it's super easy to panic, especially when you're new. I know I was uh, like really stressed when I was driving when I first started out. Um, something that helps with this is like, don't worry too much about like match results. Don't like be focused on like winning or losing. Just like be focused on like doing the best that you can. Um, if you've listened to our like behind the glass videos and you've heard like Mike like 
is every uh, something he does before every match is he, like re uh, emphasizes that we're gonna have fun in this match, right? We're not gonna go to match and be like, super stressed and like be super worried that like, things aren't gonna work out. Like we're just gonna have fun, do what we can, and then what happens happens. Uh, don't be afraid of breaking. I already went over this. Um, you want to drive your robot to the max, uh, and also don't be afraid to put your elbows out. So another thing that uh, at least for me, when I was new, is like I was super scared of like hitting other robots, right? Like something breaks, what if something goes wrong? Um, but a lot of times, like you want to be able to not be slowed down by other robots, especially if they're not actually like trying to defend you. So don't stress too much about like bumper to bumper contact. Like push your way through. You're the boss of the field. Cool. A couple anti-defense tips. Um, remember to roll off robots. Something that's super important. Uh, like super, something that's super good about Swerve is that able to roll. Uh, around defense, uh, you'll see it in like, some clips later. Uh, 1323 was basically super good because they had a swerve drive in 2019. That was a super defense heavy game. And their ability to uh, be less impacted uh, by defense because of their uh, because they could roll off was one of the things that world, what the heck? Was one of the things that won them the world championship. Uh, and when you're playing against defense, it's always uh, your main goal is to minimize bumper to bumper contact. So any time that you're touching like a defensive robot is time that they're winning and you're losing. It's always better to go around and take the long route rather than try to push through the defense, um, both because one, it's slower to push through, and B, because you can't push through every robot. Uh, you should throw fakes, especially if they're playing uh, zone defense or line defense. Um, last year, something that we learned to do is when we're taking the protected shot from the launch pad, you can basically take it, so you have your launch pad here, Oh my goodness, yeah? yeah. Like over here? Cool. So you have your launch pad here, you have your hub here, and then it feels like that, right? So something that we did last year is that we learned to throw fakes when we we're coming off of the launch pad. So we drive over here, we go over here, we shoot our two cargo, and like the defense bot's here, right? So we would throw, we basically have two options. We can go this way around to get more cargo, or we can go this way around to get more cargo. So we would throw jukes and fakes, like left and right, to basically try to buy time to get around the robot. Because once we're over here, like, they can't really do anything because we're trying to get here anyway. So, you know, that's what you want to do. All right. So when you're playing defense, um, you, want to be, you want to focus on slowing down cycles. And the key thing is this means slowing down cycles and not preventing cycles completely. Um, a lot of times, especially when you're playing zone, it's super easy to be tempted by like chasing the other robots and try to like hit them, hit them, hit them. But a lot of times it's better to sort of give them space, but be purposeful in stopping them from doing a specific thing. So for example, in 2023, uh, when you're playing D, you have the field, you have the grid, you have the grid over here, and they have to go from here to here to load, right? So if you're playing uh, zone defense, it's basically you wanna do is you wanna pick your line. So I'm gonna be playing along this line, I'm gonna hit them while they're here, and then once they're past me, I'm just gonna let them go and I'll wait, and I'll sit there, and I know it feels like you're doing nothing, but it's actually a lot better to stay in position than to chase and then be over here, and then once it's closer, it's a lot easier for them to fake you out and get around you. Cool. Um, yeah, again, and bumper to bumper time is winning, so any time that you're pushing them to the side, you're forcing them to go around, forcing them to go around, like, that's good for you. Uh, pick your marks, this is actually pretty important. Um, it's pretty important too, I guess everything's important. Uh, when you're playing defense, a lot of the times it's good to know who you're playing defense against, to know like which uh, robot on the other lines you're going to get the most value out of from playing defense. Um, it's a lot hard. It's a lot harder to play defense on an entire alliance than it is to play defense on one robot. So you're going to be more effective playing defense on one robot than just trying to like be in the middle and like be a block. Because yeah, you're not going to be able to block two robots at the same time. Um, in our finals match three against uh, on Galileo. Um, something that we did is, once we didn't take broke, we, we realized that we had to switch to playing defense, and uh, our drive coach made the call to focus on 3005, because we knew that was their top offensive bot, and we knew that um, since they're using rev swerve, like, we're not going to be at a power disadvantage. Like, when you're trying to play defense, like, don't pick, don't, like, pick, like, high tide to play defense against, because obviously it's not going to work. So, after we realized that 3005 um, had a robot failure, uh, we made the call to switch to 1114. And basically, we're just taking one robot at a time and not trying to like sit there and like try to block all three of them half heartedly. Cool. Uh, counter roll. So, counter roll is actually pretty good if you're playing against uh, Swerve. 
So if you're trying to defend a swerve, um, a lot of times they'll try to roll around you. So yeah, you swerve bot, yeah, swerve bot, and they'll try to spin like that. Uh, what you can do to make it harder for them to get around you is you can spin the other way. So instead of them being able to roll off your bumpers, if you're spinning the other way, it basically cancels out the effects of um, a roll. And uh, try to bait fouls. Don't like be like, don't be that prick who like pushes a dead robot into a protected zone. Like don't do that. It's not cool. Um, but if you're able to bait fouls, like try to. I mean, there's no downside. Uh, yeah, just don't just don't be a prick about it. And uh, also abuse pins. And pins are super powerful. You're basically able to stop the other robot from moving for the entire like five seconds, four seconds. So if there's opportunities to pin uh, the robot that you're defending against the wall, like take them, take them. Cool. Match review. So after each match, uh, what we do is we have like during each match we have someone on the side videoing either with a phone or with like an iPad or something, and then after the match. Um, we take the recording, and then me, our, uh, our operator, and a strategy mentor, uh, we basically watch the video, and then go through things that could be done better, things that we could change, and things that went well. Um, for me, it's good to, like, it sort of de-stresses, like, uh, the match. So, like, instead of, like, my memory of the match being, like, super, like, in the moment and super fuzzy, um, I know exactly what happened. I was like, oh, I did that last match, and I'll do this this match. And so, like, I think I did that, you know? So, and um, especially during playoffs, uh, having video review is super good for working on overall match flow. Um, from the, behind the glass, it's super hard to see the paths of every robot, and a view on the side makes it a lot easier to work on that. Cool, we're just gonna do some match reviews. Um, that's it for the main presentation. Um, now what I have is, I have a couple uh, videos here. One second. Let me fix my fix my setup, and then I will get them up shortly. In the meantime, any questions about anything I went over earlier? Uh, feel free to ask. Cool. This should work. All right. Uh, the first match uh, we're going to start off with is a match um, from Tazzy Champs 2022. Uh, and basically, I picked this match because this is probably the best sort of defense I've ever seen played. So we watched 498, they're over here. Uh, they're red lines, and for this match, their objective was to pick up two cargo to deny the opponent's two cargo, and then play D on 1690. Uh, we picked 1690 because they're uh, probably the, well, they were the most effective scoring robot on the blue lines, and also they had the highest delta, so they lost the highest amount of points when under defense, because if you don't defend them, their shoot on the move is super deadly, and if you defend them, they can't do as well. So if you notice 498, um, their, main of, like, their main goal right now is to stop 1690 from going to this side of the field. So if you watch, they're always positioning the robot in between uh, 1690 and the blue half of the field. They just want to keep them over here and force them to take the few cargo that are over here and have worse sidelines for the drivers. So the drivers, it's obviously a lot harder to drive over here than this drive over here if you're on blue. So that's what they're doing. You see they're abusing, uh, they're, uh, abusing pins. They're counting all the way up to the clock for each pin. And they're generally just trying to stick on the bumpers as much as possible. So here they get past them. And after this volley, you'll, you'll notice that they shift to sort of in a second there. They'll, they'll shift to pin, uh, blocking 1690 from going to the red side of the field. Because in 2022, um, something that was really important was keeping up with uh, the flow of cargo. So a lot of times um, you'll be starved on cargo on one side. Like, for example, right now the Red Alliance barely has any cargo on the red half of the field when there's like a bunch over here. So they're essentially trying to quarantine orbit to one part of the field. So here they're trying to keep them on the blue half. We don't have to watch the whole thing. That's about it. It's all important. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very, very good. We're very lucky to be able to play with them. That's what it. Yeah. So next match, uh, this one and one more, and then we're done. Uh, this is a match from 2023 Chelsea Champs. I picked all Chelsea Champs matches because they have a good video quality, not like regionals. Our regionals all have like terrible video quality. You can just see what's going on. Um, but this one, I just wanted to highlight how basically having a plan for what each of your robots is going to do, like how much match flow actually affects your scoring output. So 
for this match, our plan was to have 5A1, uh, 1538, and us, we were playing triple O. And we essentially divvied up the uh, scoring grids so that each robot was scoring in front of their own uh, driver station. So we had uh, 581 and 1538 sharing the two double station uh, double substation shelves, and then we were taking the single. And you can see we basically like pretty much never get each other way. Like we're in, we're out, and we're not spending time like like waiting for like another robot to come out of the community or like waiting to load and stuff like that. Yeah, we all, we'll leave this one going. Um, another thing that uh, being comfortable with a robot does is it helps you get a better awareness of the field. Because if you're not comfortable with a robot, uh, what you'll tend to do is you'll tend to tunnel vision and focus on driving. But if you like sort of know what the robot's going to do and you're not like um, having to question and like see what the robot's going to do, you can spend more time looking at the rest of the field. So in this case, um, I noticed that the Red Alliance was throwing a lot of game pieces out into the open zone over here. And then obviously if they're in the open zone, you're able to enter and push them out if there aren't any red robots nearby. So we had a couple free cubes and a couple short cycles by doing that. Um, and yeah, but I just really want to show this match to highlight how not getting in your alliance partner's way and like having a clear plan for each match like makes things a lot easier. Here we get a bit, a bit of traffic, but pretty much like we're never waiting for another robot to leave the community. We're never waiting for another robot to load. Yeah, that's pretty much match. Cool. And then last one, uh, this is finals two from 2023 Treasure Champs. And this is sort of an example of playing against a good swerve defense. So in this match, uh, 2910 had a mechanism failure and they pivoted to defense. Um, 2910, if you don't know, they're very, very well driven, very low CG, very quick. And for this event, they also had uh, extra motors on this swerve. So we were not able to push past them at all. Um, in the start there, you see we uh, hit 5460 midfield. This probably could have been avoided with a bit of better, like, bit of better pathing. Um, here, it probably would have been better to cut in and go straight to the protected zone instead of beating the midfield. Um, yeah, that's something we could have done better here. Like, we see, if, as an offense spot, you want to minimize the time that you're spent like hitting the other alliances robots. See 20 on 10 pivots to defense, and we're first like, we're like, what the heck? Why is 20 on 10 on defense? And then after this cycle, we're able to sort of show a bit more about what good anti-defense driving looks like. So here you can see we can roll around them, not trying to push past them at all. We're not afraid to take a longer route if it means like keeping our speed up. There's a fake. Another one, and then nice roll, so they can't get good contact on our bumpers. And again, I want to highlight how important it is to have good match flow. Uh, we split the substations between us and 250. We had 254 uh, taking from the shelf here, and we were taking from the single, and then 5190 was taking cubes from out here. So we're all loading in different zones. We're all scoring in different spots. Other or wait for each other very much at all. We'll watch as much to the end, and then that'll be it. Yeah, see, lots of spinning. <laughs> and then, I think after this we go to con, so. Let me do one more cycle. Yeah, so, and then once you've done a few fakes in the match, a lot of times, like, uh, the other team will start to expect a fake. So if they do that, that's actually better for you because you can just take the straight line and then you both throw them up and you get the path. Cool, that was fun. All right, that's about it. Uh, sorry if I seem a bit disorganized. Sorry, just long day of matches and just had to run from the last match. All right, thank you. All right, 6-11. All right, um, I'll hang on for questions and... Yes.
Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll put that up. Uh, try to duplicate. And then, boom, there you go. Yeah, let's go, let's go a couple of things, like, about each team on the side, too. That'll be good. Yeah. Don't say any more questions. Yes. How do you deal with summer and Yeah, I mean, you just have to, like, recognize, basically, like, kick your fights, you know? So, like, sometimes, like, if an alliance partner really wants to do one thing, and you know that you're probably, like, might be better to do a different thing, but it's not going to be that match, it's not going to be match-affecting, like, you know, Paul is going to be super unbalanced one way or the other, either way, like, a lot of times it's good to just, like, you know, let him go, and then note it down. Um, if you're an alliance captain, you're like, yeah. So, what are your best tips for balancing? For balancing on the charge, okay. For balancing on the charge station, uh, what you want to do is you want to have your three robots, or I'm guessing you want to do a triple. Triple is probably the hardest. I'll, I'll ex explain the triple. Uh, what you want to do is have your robots, uh, your three robots, you, have, you want to have two on the station, right? So you have two either tipping it down towards the community uh, or the open field. Uh, you want to be in agreement on this, because if it's tipped one way, and you're trying to come in from the other side, it's going to waste a lot of time. Uh, you want to tip it one way, and then have two bots sort of on the station with it tipped, and you want one bot to do the balancing. So if these robots can lock their wheels, that's awesome. If they can't, well, same, same sort of concept. And you want your last robot to do the forward and back balancing. What you don't want to do is sort of have a, uh, a death wobble of you guys going back and forth and back and forth. Um, that's what's going to mess up your triple. So the two ways to do it are either have everyone go up at once, which is what we did in uh, Chesley Champs playoffs, because we want all three robots to be on the field as long as possible. Or if it's like a less close match and you're okay with climbing early, um, you can play it safer by having two robots on the station docked and the third one do the balancing. Cool. Yeah. 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 Doesn't really matter. Um, there's no difference. Bye, Krakens. Go Krakens. I'm, I'm a Kraken, 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 uh, Kraken stand. What's up, Brendan? No, you, you don't like him? Uh, I would recommend Falcons over Heroes because uh, what we've seen is the type of team that just start matches and they do it anyway. That's true. Yeah, but like, yeah. Falcon encoders are better for auto, they're higher resolution, but for tally up driving, as long as like, your electrical is solid, there's no real difference. You're not going to like be losing on power with a Neo or anything. Give me Breaker Limited anyway. I saw you just. Um, nice. So when, when I'm driving, I miss my high up so many times. Mm -hmm. The operator has to let go of the low up and lock the second one down. Mm -hmm. So, sort of, I'm not quite understanding what you mean by Mart. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, basically, like for us, what we do is we want to have the marks line up. So if you're slower, like midfield, but your mark is sort of closer to the grid, like it doesn't matter. You're slower to the midfield because you're doing the same things at the same time. So for us, what we do is when we have, say, you have like the charge station, you have like the wall here, you have like the community like that, right? Uh, we Tap our arm, so we pull up our arm to prepare to score, sort of before. I think that's sort of like what you're saying. Uh, and we use the um, edge of the community as our mark. So if we're not road turned around by the time we're at the edge of the community, it's like kind of bad anyway, because no robots can be playing defense here, right? Because that's asking to get fouled. So you know it's pretty safe to get turned around by you here. And the operator is an easy tape line. Does that sort of answer? Like, Yeah, um, yeah, we've had that too, especially in 2022 when you're shooting. Uh, we had a lot of issues at start, like when to shoot between the driver and the operator, because I have to stop the drive base to shoot. Uh, I think that's sort of like what you're saying, like you want to have the same uh, queue. 
uh, what we do is we basically just communicate, like verbal communication behind the glass. Um, a lot of for the things that affect both the operator and the driver, like if I'm like, if they like, like if they like do something that like doesn't affect the way I drive, like it's whatever. Um, but for things that affect uh, the drive base, we like to either A, put them on the same controller, or B, just have a verbal call out for each thing. So even if it's like a bit slower to, for you to say like, ready, and then they uh, extend the arm, um, you just don't want to be consistent and have them use you as a mark instead of trying to pick different marks on the field. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, I was going to ask. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of things that are kind of different in design. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Apple doesn't usually want to have like, mm -hmm. the verb on this chip. Like, yep. Are there other things that drivers might have in mind? Because like, you have preferences that are specific, but kind of actually don't. Um, so can you explain about what those are and stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, wide acquisition zones. We love wide acquisition zones. Is that like sort of general? Like, is that what you're talking about? I'm wondering if you have any Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, wide acquisition zone, good every year. Makes it easy to line up, don't have to take as long. Um, another thing that is sort of a debate among teams is if you want to be light and quick, or if you want to be like sort of max weight and barrel through uh, other robots. I personally like a light and quick robot more. Um, this year we were like 87 pounds and we briefly considered switching to like adding ballast to the robot to make it heavier, to make it easier to cross midfield. But having a light robot helps you in other ways um, besides just like avoiding defense. It lowers your battery draw, you have quicker acceleration, and you can stop. <laughs> and yeah, so I personally like a quick robot. Um, obviously both approaches are okay, like high tide did just fine with a max weight robot, so. You should ask your drivers if they want a smaller, like quicker, more nimble robot, or like a large tank. I think we're about done. Uh, you're free to go. I'll stick around.